Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama. Hare Krishna, dear devotees, uh, and welcome to the first in the series of interviews on this very important topic of unity in diversity in ISKCON. My name is Madan Gopal Das. I serve as the Zonal Supervisor of four of our ISKCON centers in the Northeast region, as well as I serve as the Co-Director of ISKCON Communications for North America. So we have with us today one of the leaders of ISKCON. He's a prolific author and a member of the Sabha, His Grace, Kalakanta Prabhu. So Kalakanta Prabhu, he is a disciple of uh, ISKCON founder Acharya, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. And he is also leading proponent of the Krishna House projects and one of the uh, uh, you know inspirers uh, traveling over North America, uh, giving guidance in this very important initiative. So uh, I'll pass it on to Kalakanta Prabhu. Perhaps if you want to say some something else. And I'm we... very happy to be here, and thank you very much for the opportunity to to discuss these important topics. And thanks to everybody who's tuning in. Yeah. So, uh, Kalakanda Prabhu, uh, thank you again for joining. Could you kindly give us perhaps a little more of your background in, in regards to the spreading of Krishna consciousness and preaching work and sharing, et cetera? Thank you. Well, I've, I had my whole career here in North America. I became a Brahmacharya in 1972 and distributed books for uh, six years, including two academic libraries with the library party. And then I uh, took a service of recruiting and training young devotees in Los Angeles under the guidance of Dhanavir Maharaj for two years. That was very formative for me because it, it made a deep impression and showed me how meaningful it can be to bring young people into Krishna consciousness in this part of the world. So this was around the time of Srila Prabhupada's disappearance. Uh, after that, for the next 42 years, basically, I've served as a temple president and consultant and in various uh, roles in ISKCON North America. Uh, thank you, Prabhu. So you mentioned Srila Prabhupada's uh, disappearance in, in 1977. How, how would you say his disappearance affected ISKCON in North America in particular? At the time of Srila Prabhupada's presence, people were regularly moving into the temples and ashrams in the various centers around North America, of which there were about 50 at that time. Um, so there was sort of a sense that people would always be joining. And we took that for granted, and people were requested to go to other parts of the world. They, they were freely given to open up Christian consciousness and Australasia and India and Europe, and uh, people kept coming. So after Srila Prabhupada's disappearance, uh, for other reasons as well, the phenomenon of young people joining the temples, joining the ashrams stopped, uh, or it slowed to a trickle. And uh, the temples were then saved by the congregation, the Indian diaspora, the devotees who had migrated or Indians who had migrated to America in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, found shelter in the ISKCON temples that had been started by the young Westerners earlier. So they stepped in and uh, financed and, and led and, and developed the temples for many years. So uh, the main thing I have seen over these 50 years is the lack of balance between the, what we had in the 60s and what we've had subsequent to Prabhupada's departure. So my personal preaching effort has been to restore that balance and bring a kind of a <clears throat> excuse me, unified approach to spreading Krishna consciousness in North America. No, thank you, Prabhu. Um, yeah, that is something that is a very striking pattern over the decades. Um, now, you have been quite active in promoting the Vaishnavi Diksha Gurus, making a film, writing books, organizing petitions, and of course, you've made some presentations to the GBC. Why do you feel this particular uh, idea is, is important? It's related, Madan Gopal Prabhu, to the goal of bringing balance to the congregations in our temples. Um, but even aside from that, 
first of all, it's philosophically correct. This was what Prabhupada said. This is the application of Krishna consciousness in this particular part of the world. Uh, I think Chandrasekhar Swami is going to discuss that in more detail. <clears throat> There's a moral aspect of this also to me. I have seen a number of my God sisters get direct instructions from Srila Prabhupada to preach, and they have given their entire lives to preaching. Now they're grandmothers. They have people who want to take initiation from them. They meet every qualification, and yet they're being denied. Uh, so morally, philosophically, I'm certain, quite certain, Srila Prabhupada would be very uh, in, much in favor of his senior disciples giving Diksha. Now, particularly in North America, we seek to attract educated people to ISKCON from all communities for the sake of balance and future leadership. Srila Prabhupada very much stressed this in his preaching in North America that we should uh, reach out to college students, educated people, leaders. Uh, now, the reality is that in this part of the world, if there is institutionalized gender bias, educated people will not take us seriously. What do you speak of joining? They will look at ISKCON as a very backwards organization, uh, Taliban-like, uh, restricting the uh, activities of one gender. Uh, this doesn't work in this part of the world. Srila Prabhupada saw this clearly. He is noted for making many exceptions to traditions, uh, especially around that of accommodating uh, ladies who wanted to practice Krishna consciousness. So. My purpose in making the film and writing the books and making presentations and doing petitions has been to show the young educated devotees in the, that we have been blessed to train that ISKCON is an organization that allows people to freely pre present their points of view. This institutionalized gender bias can be confronted. And this, my efforts have allowed some young people to develop faith in ISKCON in spite of the still very uh, regressive attitudes from some parts of the world towards women's roles in spiritual leadership. Now, if I may add another practical point, amongst my God brothers and God sisters, Prabhupada had about 4,000 disciples. Only 2% of them have agreed to uh, offer diksha. It is uh, something Srila Prabhupada specifically asked all of his disciples to do, but hardly anyone wants to do it. As a result, we have just a handful of people who have uh, huge numbers of disciples that they are unable to give a lot of attention to, and gurus are desperately needed. So as far as women are concerned, that re represents 40% of Prabhupada's disciples. We're immediately losing this huge, valuable resource by discriminating against women in the matter of giving diksha. Uh, Srila Prabhupada personally said that some, but not many, women are welcome to take this role, and that would meet our needs sufficiently. If it is some, but not many, that works. Then we can appeal to educated people, yes, we do not discriminate based on the body, just as we're teaching. We practice what we preach. Uh, but none is not the same as some. So having some women giving diksha will remove this Taliban-like image that haunts ISKCON preaching to local people in North America. That mood is not even close to the mood that Srila Prabhupada established, uh, giving shelter to women, creating brahmacharini ashrams, uh, encourage them, in them to do very unvedic things like going out and distributing books and collecting money, which they did in great profusion, in, especially in the 70s. So does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Thank you, Prabhu. Um, I think it's, it's, it's so important. And Prabhupada did mention so many times that I want us to, or he wants us to, to really connect with the 
cream of society, you know, the educated people, those who are in power, those who are influential, the politicians, the big businessmen and so on, you know, those, those who are, you know, because then they can really impact, you know, a handful of such influential people can impact so much more. And of course, in this day and age, educated, uh, it's very hard to get through to educated people if you just come across immediately as uh, discriminatory based on, you know, something as, uh, you know, as uh, like a bodily designation, which is not even part of our philosophy. So, right, yes. So that's, yes. that's a very good point. It's a very good point. Yes. Thank yes, you. as we see in, in our society in, in, in North America, the leadership roles of women are increasing exponentially in all facets of society, as you mentioned, business, education, politics, uh, uh, journalism. The, the uh, idea of gender discrimination is considered as ignorant as racial discrimination. And this is a way that particularly young people evaluate religious organizations. How do they treat women and how do they treat the environment? These are the two main things that, that uh, people will consider when looking at, it, at an institution like ours. Right, and, and discrimination, I mean, it is almost classified together with say, for example, racial discrimination. Mm -hmm. And gender discrimination and racial discrimination are always put in the same basket when mm -hmm. viewed from the point of law or when point of uh, you know evaluating the uh, the um, you know evolution say or evaluating the uh, advancement of any organization you know and uh, uh, and I, it's hard to 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 not to not oh, it's hard to separate them really so it's hard to say that no we're not at all racist but we will never allow women to be you know a particular level or a particular role of leadership in this uh, organization and that yeah. that itself would uh, wouldn't fly so no exactly and that's exactly why uh, when we approach such educated people they're very skeptical about our society so we need to show them that's why i personally have been vocal about it it augments my preaching and efforts to reach educated people for Srila Prabhupada. right and it's interesting if i might add my own experience i was just at a hindu conference and this is like all hindu temples in north america just a few months ago in cincinnati and every organization was coming forward and saying we are going to promote women priests in our hindu temples mm -hmm. uh, we are going to we are going to uh, kick off any signs of discrimination we're going to give equal opportunity to all women interesting observations they had and the, and so it seems like we as iskon one of the first hindu organizations in north america are being left behind by almost every other hindu temple organization which is i found very unusual you know that so. is very that is very interesting a, a professor friend of mine took a group of students to india recently and they toured a variety of temples and when he came back he said his students were struck by how the iskon temples were the most discriminatory towards women they did not encounter that in any other temples only in iskon temples where the women restricted to this area and in, in various ways kind of uh, segregated. Right. So um, I did have the uh, good fortune of, uh, you know, traveling to quite a few temples and other places. And I'm seeing that there's there's a push for uh, diversity in ISKCON. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a push that, you know, we really must do something now. We must do something to, to make it, make our temple more reflective of the neighborhood in which its temple sits. You know, if the neighborhood is, um, you know, 80% non-Indian and 20% Indian, then our congregation should more or less reflect that. That's the mark of a successful nonprofit organization. So, Correct. So, so what would you say is the current situation in terms of diversity in North America? And what would you comment on that? Well, temples are very eager to diversify their congregations. As I mentioned, many of the temples have been led by members of the Indian communities and our congregations, and, and they have salvaged the temple, saved them, kept them going, and now they see, yes, we want to be relevant, we want to diversify. And they also recognize that doing this is more difficult than reaching the Indian community. Uh, it, it, it's an entirely different effort to to teach somebody uh, who knows Sanatana Dharma or is at least familiar with the terminology and the concepts than to somebody who is brand new to it. If I may, uh, I'd like to share my screen and show a, a purport from the Chaitanya Charitamrita in which Prabhupada discusses that. Would that be all right? Srila Prabhupada writes that um, <clears throat> to broadcast the cult of Krishna consciousness, one has to learn the possibility of renunciation in terms of country, 
time and candidate. A candidate for Krishna consciousness in the Western countries should be taught about the renunciation of material existence. But one would teach candidates from a country like India in a different way. The teacher, Acharya, has to consider time, candidate, and country. He must avoid the principle of the amagraha. That is, he should not try to perform the impossible. What is possible in one country may not be possible in another. The Acharya's duty is to accept the essence of devotional service. There may be a little change here and there as far as yukta vairagya, proper renunciation, is concerned. This is from Madhya Leela 23.105. You know, I, in reading Srila Prabhupada's books, I've come to appreciate the Chaitanya Charitamrita as, in many respects, the mature fruit of his literary and preaching experience. Uh, he, he did not have ISKCON when he wrote the first canto of Bhagavatam, for example. And, and the, the, uh, the Gita ISKCON was a fledgling organization. So by the time he was doing Chaitanya Charitamrita, ISKCON had taken birth and developed, and he was reflecting in purports like this and many, many others about the practical experiences he had had in introducing Krishna consciousness in the North America and, and in the Western countries. Paschatya Deshatarani, preaching in the Western part of the world. Uh, the um, recognizing that things have to be done differently to do this very difficult task of reaching local audiences in, in Western countries. Our, our leaders have uh, asked me to share with them the model of Krishna House in Gainesville that I've been working on for the last 17 years. Um, Gainesville is a small town, college town, and no one had been joining there for many years. Uh, uh, but in 2008, we tried a model based on Prabhupada's experiences on 26 Second Avenue, and that has been successful. We have had hundreds and hundreds of people now who have joined over the last 17 years, joined, come for studying, uh, and, and these are serious devotees, educated people. They've taken up leadership roles at ISKCON. They have done book distribution. Uh, they've opened other centers. So uh, this model is based on Samadarshina, the same way that Prabhupada practiced it in 26th Second Avenue in New York. You know, after the initial growth of ISKCON, it became kind of a uh, focused on organization on book distribution. Brahmachari life was strongly encouraged. Prabhupada left us around that time physically, and we've kind of been stuck in that model, which is no longer working. It just is, uh, it's outdated. And the, the model today that has worked has been when we've set up in Gainesville. And now I've had many requests from temples around the country to help them establish similar programs. So I've retired from Gainesville and focusing my time on that now. At this point, we have temples in the Houston, Dallas, uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Toronto, Philadelphia, that have opened Krishna houses and are actively developing them as well as in Gainesville. And it's working. People are coming, people are, are joining. The, the leaders recognize the value of the model. Uh, the gender equity is a big factor in that. We have a, another 10 or 12 temples who have expressed interest and who are taking steps towards creating the facilities necessary. So, that, that is, to me, evidence of how important diversity in the congregations is to the temples in North America. That's uh, actually, thank you so much for, for pushing this Krishna House model, because I also, um, I mean, I think a lot of the temple presidents, other leaders are, are at a loss. I'm, I'm being very frank that we've tried so many different things. Let's make the Sunday program more, you know, open and let's rebrand it a different way so that we get different, you know, more diversity in our congregation as Sunday attendees with the hope that the congregational model of, you know, new guests coming just on Sundays uh, and but still living in their home will will also work like it works for the Indian diaspora will also work for the non Indian uh, you know, population, but that does not seem to be sticking or to some, I mean, maybe a few, but it's not to any good uh, extent in terms of uh, the ratios. Uh, but I'm seeing that Krishna house model where you uproot the person who is of a non-Indian background from their environment completely and have an immersive experience um, because perhaps their environment may not be as conducive to the um, Sanatan Dharmic 
models as per, as say uh, an, um, a person from Indian background would have in their home. So that seems very natural that you know it's it's important to approve them. Uh, I, I've also seen the success of this in Kenya, which you know just to add uh, this very similar model like how you you've you've done and uh, my good friend in Kenya uh, who who's running this now has about fifty plus African young African students who are living in the temple. Uh, and now he, he, my friend also got married. Uh, and so his wife is now starting a women's ashram and they, they have, I think about a dozen or so ladies who joined, joined mm -hmm. as well. And so that gender equity is also helping and they have 50 or 60 African devotees, uh, which is very hard to get, uh, you know, in, in, in this day and age, but now this young men and women becoming Hare Krishnas while paying rent, while, while going to college, it's amazing. So, mm -hmm. uh, Krishna Krishna's model, I think, is not just for U.S. I think it'll work globally. We see it happening. So I, you know, definitely there's something to this, something magical about it. Um, but I agree that if we don't have a clear expression of equity, of equal access and equal opportunity, disregarding the bodily designations in a very practical way, um, it'll only be offering lip service, which is why we see these things working, Krishna House, that yes, oh, you, you have women leaders as well. That's great. you know. And exactly. Yes, exactly. And then th this was the mood, Prabhu, in the early days of ISKCON, that um, the temples were very welcoming places, very accepting places. Everybody was encouraged and appreciated. And this is why so many people were joining, young people were joining like crazy. There was a warm family mood, and uh, there was no sense of, of gender discrimination, racial discrimination, uh, and, and that was very appealing to the ideals of young people. It still is. It still is. Um, in, in the Krishna House model, and, and by the way, the, the young man in Kenya, his name is... Govinda Prem Prabhu. Govinda Prem, yes. He, he graced us with a visit in Gainesville some years ago, and we, we went through all of these things with him, and it's wonderful to see how he's applied it there. As you know, when Srila Prabhupada went to Kenya, he was encouraging the devotees there, don't just reach out to the Indian community, you reach out to the locals. He stressed that very strongly. And so for, for Govinda Prem Prabhu to get these educated local populations is wonderful. Um, I just would like to mention in regards to this, Prabhu, that the, the gender discrimination, the racial discrimination, those things are just huge impediments for Paschatya De Satarani. Other things that we have experienced is that a lot of stress on seniority is a big turnoff to young men and women. Uh, a, a focus on one's Diksha Guru is a big turnoff to young men and women. Uh, people can take up Krishna consciousness with Prabhupada at the center. And the Diksha Guru is a secondary matter. The Diksha Guru is to help formalize our connection with Srila Prabhupada. Um, this has, in, in Gainesville, allowed us to bring in young men and women who've taken Diksha from 15 different uh, by, uh, ISKCON Diksha Gurus. And there's a sense of equality. We don't emphasize that by any means. The, the other thing, as senior devotees, we try to stay in the background instead of putting ourselves front and center and saying, oh, I'm senior, you should do whatever I say. We try to keep ourselves in the background and get the, let the younger people take leadership. Uh, all of these things are aspects of samadarshina, equal vision, that have proven a, to be attractive to the local populations. In addition to that, what you said is so important. This immersive experience is essential for non-Hindus. Uh, it is absolutely a must for young Westerners to become immersed and steeped in Vedic culture. They can't do it uh, easily while living somewhere else and associating with non-devotees very intimately. But very quickly, when they come together and they come in this immersive environment, it is amazing to see how quickly and how deeply and how sincerely they become engaged in Krishna's service. Um, if I may, I'd like to just share a, a picture, a couple of pictures of our ashrams, just to give you a sense of uh, the, the type of people and their appreciation. Uh, here is a, this is a picture of the Gainesville um, 
Krishna House. This is the graduating class of 2022, young men and women. Uh, nearly all of these are residents of the ashram there. You'll see devotees from Indian backgrounds, from Western backgrounds. It is no sense of discrimination. Uh, a lot of these young men and women are in college or working and highly educated professional people. Um, these are the sorts of people who would have not come to our temples uh, in, years ago in, in, until we stumbled on, on, on the idea of doing things the way Prabhupada did them on 26 Second Avenue. Then everything changed. When, when the women were treated nicely, uh, we, we empowered the young people to take leadership roles. Then it became so attractive that now we have all of our ashram beds, 25 are, are full year round, more or less. Uh, and this is this is quite astounding, Prabhu. This is, uh, it looks, yeah. this looks like one of the old, old day photographs of, you know, Srila Prabhupada. It looks like one of the olden day pictures of Srila Prabhupada, uh, you know, where you have, you know, young men and women almost equal in number. And you have the diversity of, uh, you know, the racial diversity you see um, that's more reflective of, of the environment or the town that your center is based. It's, 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 it's amazing, but it shouldn't be. <laughs> well said because it's yes. amazing but it shouldn't be because if you just have to ex extrapolate from 1970 this should be looking the same all the way but because we have gone down a wrong path in terms of prioritization um the, in this there's many i'm sure there's so many reasons why we we went down you mentioned some of them uh but here we are the same time everybody yearns for the old days and sometimes that yearning is almost like we'll never get them back but you're mm -hmm. proving that today in 2023 that no they are here. Those same days are here. We just have to just go back to the basics and just do what Prabhupada did, you know? Yes, yes, that, that's my goal, Prabhu. And you're, you're absolutely right. Then the magic, it's still there. Yes. It is amazing. And, and <clears throat> so talking on this point of um, equal access to the genders, I, I have spoken to quite a few of the, uh, the women disciples of Srila Prabhupada, the very senior, uh, you know, uh, leaders or not just leaders but senior devotees in our movement you know who who are Vaishnavis and uh and they've always whenever we talk about Shri Prabhupada their face lights up and they always talk about how Shri Prabhupada empowered them even though they felt insignificant how sometimes he would empower them beyond their own capacities and even you know you know give them leadership like an encouragement that no you can go out you're the same as the, all the boys and girls they're the same what Prabhupada used to say and when it comes to Krishna consciousness uh, you're equally powerful and things like that and he would empower them so much and he would promote them and he would also shut down any critics that were coming the Prabhupada did face some critics uh, from among his god brothers who were in India uh, by how much because of how much he was empowering the women because they, the critics had their own reasons uh, conservative Indian society would not uh, you know wouldn't really promote them so much but Prabhupada did and Prabhupada did say that I'm doing it as an acharya like you pointed out the acharya does this from the comment from the quote that you shared um, so when I see these same senior devotees, Vaishnavis now, um, looking at the state of affairs today, um, you know, their smile sort of wanes. It's unfortunate because they see that it's a, it's a, we're regressing. Or we have regressed uh, to before Prabhupada's empowerment days, which is unfortunate that, you know, Prabhupada's 12 years with us in, in the West was the most golden time. And then after that, the slow decay of women's empowerment that Prabhupada had promoted. So perhaps uh, if, if you can comment on that, and also perhaps we can discuss about why that regression is still strong. Uh, and we are hearing that a lot in India and there's uh, it's, it's universally known that, especially among our um, you know, Indian or from the India side, that there is a lot of pushback against the idea of Vaishnavis taking up the service of initiating devotees. So why would you, perhaps you can share your reflections on, on where that is coming from and perhaps what, how we can find some common ground to resolve that. Yes, Prabhu. I've had a lot of discussions with my friends and brothers in India who are ISKCON leaders and are concerned about Vaishnavi Diksha gurus. Uh, they, they say that the, there would be a loss of ISKCON's good reputation in India. I can appreciate that argument because ISKCON is appreciated in India because it's conservative. 
but in the West, it is looked down upon if it is excessively conservative. So the, the question is whether we can work in a cooperative way and strike a balance. Uh, I think that purport that I referenced and many others indicate that Prabhupada saw that things could be done differently in different parts of the world. Um, so this idea of loss of reputation in India strikes me as unbalanced because really which is more important, you know, to, to have some alleged respect from certain Hindu organizations in India, or to be able to reach a diversified population, uh, especially in the developed parts of the world, India, Europe, I mean, America, Europe, Canada, Australasia, um, where those sense of, of discrimination doesn't, doesn't apply and doesn't fly. So, um, plus there are hundreds of women gurus in India. Everybody knows that. Some of them are quite famous and quite popular. So um, the people in the West have no problem if the devotees in India want to have a different system. So I don't know why the devotees in India can't tolerate the devotees in the West doing things in a way that works here. Um, <clears throat> sometimes they speak rather strongly. They say, oh, this is just feminism. It's just the hippie mentality coming out. Uh, nothing can be farther from the truth. Uh, the, these devotees who are joining us are very serious devotees. Uh, they're far more uh, qualified than many of us were when we took up Srila Prabhupada's service in the 70s. They have advanced degrees. They, they have great ideas for promoting Krishna consciousness, uh, great experience uh, with uh, um, <clears throat> social media and other popular uh, venues now. So uh, and it, it's far from a fringe, radical view that men and women should be treated equally. It is by far the mainstream view. And in fact, the only people in this part of the world who really advocate gender discrimination are the least likely to take interest in Krishna consciousness. That would be the ultra-fanatic, ultra-conservative, uh, right-wing type of people who would just say, women have to be barefoot and pregnant in our house. You know? Are part of it. So very, and those people would have no interest in our message. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the other thing that they argue sometimes is that, again, a very spurious argument to me, that if we allow women to uh, initiate and ISKCON and treat women equitably, then it's going to lead to uh, promotion of homosexuality. Uh, uh, women will, will take over, they will dominate. Uh, and and the, this is not Vedic. Uh, this is, this is a, a um, classic example of a non sequitur or a logical fallacy called the slippery slope. Uh, acting out of fear. Oh, if we do this, then all these terrible things will happen. If you actually analyze the arguments that the people who oppose Vaishnavi Diksha gurus give, you will see that most of it is based on fear. Now, where, Prabhu, in our experience with Srila Prabhupada, did he make decisions based on fear? <laughs> he was a constant innovator and did things that worked. And this gender equity works in this part of the world. So the real question is, do we want ISKCON to be an exclusively Hindu organization uh, in India and around the world, or do we want to reach local populations? And if we want to reach locals, we have to make the adjustments. It is not going to lead to uh, the introduction of homosexuality or other, other uh, types of what is uh, non-Vedic social patterns, you might say. And at the same time, homosexual people take interest in Krishna consciousness. What is our position with them? Are they, uh, should we say to them, oh, you don't chant Hare Krishna, you don't practice bhakti? That's another form of discrimination that, again, makes no sense in the context of where we are preaching. <clears throat> so uh, these two issues are not at all connected, except in the application of Bhagavad Gita, which you are not your body. And your bodily designations are no grounds for deciding our relationship. Uh, everyone has a relationship with Krishna. So. Um, when the homosexual people and gay or lesbian people take up Krishna consciousness, Prabhupada uh, would tell them just, 
to chant Hare Krishna, add Krishna to their lives, and follow the regulative principles. He had a number of gay disciples, many of them, <clears throat> and, and he never made any distinction. Uh, he even had transgender disciples, and they, to them he said, just choose one and stick with it. <laughs> the, the, the main point is to not put the bodily considerations above bhakti. And to me, this is exactly what is happening with people who oppose Vaishnavi Diksha Gurus. The only reason is the, their body. There's no other reason for discriminating against them. Uh, so really, the, the issue, Prabhu, is, is, has more political and control overtones than philosophical. The devotees in America were all, uh, North America, were the first ones to join. And so they were the leaders of ISKCON for decades. And they, they were dominating on the GBC. Uh, they were the founders of ISKCON in many other countries in Europe and Australia, as well as India. And they gave money and manpower for years. So they naturally had a dominant role in the leadership of ISKCON after Prabhupada's departure. That's changing. Uh, ISKCON in India has been hugely successful. Devotees have done amazing things. And um, recently, when we asked the GBC representative um, why this decision was made recently to, to continue the 20-year repression of women initiating by another three years, he said, well, the temples in India have 70% of the assets of ISKCON, and they don't want it, so we have to kind of defer to them. I said, Wait, wait, wait a minute here. <laughs> um, I could understand how the Indians would feel the hegemony, how the domination of the Westerners has been repressive or seemed like it. Uh, and it, there should be uh, equal representation for leadership, absolutely. Uh, but to you don't uh, fix one extreme by going to the other. <laughs> You know, the, and, and so for the devotees in India to essentially say, preaching to Westerners is not important. Uh, most of the temples in the West have Indian congregations, so we should just really appeal to Indians. And it's ridiculous to adopt these feminist hippie uh, approaches to just try to attract cheap followers. Prabhu, the people who say this have zero experience. And I've personally investigated that they have zero experience bringing a single Western person to Krishna consciousness. So who are they to tell us who are doing it, how we should do it? Yes. Does that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. It does. And, and, and from my experience, look, looking at the history and reading about it, there's only one Indian body ISKCON devotee who's been successful in, in making numerous Western devotees. Uh, and that is Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, other than that, you know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's only Westerners who have been fairly successful in bringing other Westerners into the fold. But I think with this Krishna house model, it doesn't matter who's taking the lead. I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. you know, well, yeah. that, that's true. And, uh, but there's also a desire. It's a desire is there. If, if I may, I'll share another picture with you that I wanted to show. Uh, there, there is a very wonderful devotee in uh, Delaware named Krishna Kirtan Prabhu, who has uh, visited recently. This is, let's see, oh, where is that picture? Well, I can't find it, I'm sorry. Oh, there we go, yeah. This is the congregation in Iskand, Delaware, that um, Krishna Kirtan Prabhu, who is uh, of Indian descent, I believe, South Indian. Yes, uh, he set Orissa. up this, pardon me? He's from Orissa. Oh, Orissa, Orissa, okay, yeah. I mean, but he, he's brought in a wonderful variety of people from all communities there in Delaware. And uh, he's interested in working with, he, with me to start a Christian house there um, so that he can accommodate the, yes, both, both Indian and Western. And, and that's beautiful. That's what we want in all of our temples. And they appreciate each other. They can benefit. Each community benefits from the presence of the others. Especially, you know, the young, the sons and daughters of the Indian immigrant families who are being raised in the West, uh, when they see their parents' spiritual practices are relevant to their peers, then they, their conviction increases dramatically. But if they think it's only an ethnic thing and just for my ethnic group, then they question its value and relevance to their lives. 
right? Because being born here, they don't identify so much with their ethnicity. They identify with their peers more in terms yes. of their identity, uh, not so much the color of their skin or, you know, and that, that is in, in many ways, it's actually a spiritual kind of angle that I'm yes. not the color of my skin, you know? <laughs> Uh, it's interesting, yes. Yeah. And sometimes the, the people who oppose Vaishnavi Diksha gurus point out Hungary. Uh, that is one yatra that is very much opposed to Vaishnavi Diksha gurus. And they say, well, this is an example of the West not needing uh, women in roles of leadership. So the, the, we have to look a little bit deeper. Hungary is a country of 10 million people. Uh, the ethnicity is 98% Hungarian. <laughs> Yeah. And they have had they have one of the most authoritarian histories of any country in Europe. An entirely different dynamic. I've never preached there. I never preached in India extensively. So I don't pretend to tell them how to run things in their part of the world. And likewise, they, I don't want them to tell us how to run things in our part of the world. Let us do what works. Right. Um, and it, this is the GBC's decision on the subject of Vaishnavi Diksha Gurus. Let each area decide. And so in our unity and diversity, <clears throat> excuse me, committee, we are promoting that, yes, this is the right decision. Let each yatra make decisions on matters of cultural sensitivity. Because one size does not fit all. We are not impersonalists. You know, <clears throat> there is variety, there's diversity, and then our goal is to maintain the unity at Srila Prabhupada's lotus feet. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this this idea of uh, say geographic variations uh, of application of policy or you know guidelines, um, it's I mean that was proposed and that was actually approved and then it got it kind of went back and forth. But uh, do you see any practical reason why that shouldn't be uh, reestablished again or i mean they, they must have been you know i'm just trying to figure out how what is it what is it that the indian yatra or the indian leadership is concerned about especially considering that they did allow it for a short while and then rescinded on it uh, but it seems that are there any other major concerns is there any other roadway that we on some common ground we can find to 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 come come to a, a consensus uh, that's uh, applicable or compromising yeah. I don't see any other one, uh, Madan Gopal Prabhu, other than what the GBC has already decided. <clears throat> they have decided, let each part of the world decide. Let each part of the world make their own policies in these, in these matters. That will allow us to go forward in unity and diversity. No one part of the world should dominate the other. No one part of the world should bully the other. The, uh, <clears throat> some of my Indian friends have said, what will happen if some of our young men and women who are Indian descent in America or North America come back to India, having been initiated by a Vaishnavi, uh, then they will start promoting their guru and they'll start creating problems. I, I think this is a very, again, it's a, it's a slippery slope argument, a fear, what if, what if, what if, <laughs> something we never heard from Prabhupada. Uh, the, the importance of Paschatya De Sitarne far outweighs any theoretical possible risks like that, in my opinion. Um, I, and, and we had a unanimous vote amongst the North American leadership at our last meeting in favor of Vaishnavi Diksha Gurus in this part of the world. Uh, delaying it is hurting us. Delaying it is damaging our preaching. Um, now, Sometimes there, there's one center in North America that has been pointed to, well, they don't think that women should have leadership roles and they're flourishing. This is the Krishna Life Center in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Before these devotees started that center, they came to visit us in Gainesville. I freely shared with them about uh, how we've done what has worked and they've applied about half of it. Uh, they have a, an ashram for ladies and, and, uh, but they want to stay separate from ISKCON. I asked to come and visit them. They said, no, we don't want you to visit. We invited them, please partake in our, our leadership meetings. They don't want to take part. And uh, some of the devotees in India will point there and say, well, they're doing a lot of books and they, they're having local people join, to which I say, wonderful, it's great, but let us see how it develops. Because the same problems that ISKCON in North America encountered as the movement matured will certainly come upon them. What will happen when people want to get married? What will happen 
to these uh, brahmacharis who are not really suited for lifelong renunciation? Have they been prepared? And what will happen when the women who are joining realize that they are second-class citizens in that particular social structure, that they are not allowed to have the same leadership roles as men? Uh, are they aware of that? Are they tuned into this? This may be the reason why they want to stay separate from ISKCON. But my point is that, uh, as Prabhupada said, a cup of milk in the ocean does not make a milk ocean. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there may be exceptions here or there, but the by and large, the uh, application of gender equity is what makes ISKCON work. It made it work in Prabhupada's time. It makes it work now as far as working and reaching local populations. That's a great point, Prabhu. Uh, I, I've done quite a bit of reading myself, uh, or at least on this point. I, I went through quite a few Prabhupada's writings in his purports, in his letters, and in his speeches, and so on. And pretty much everywhere I've seen, and, and I mean, he has actually laid out his vision that he expects his sons and daughters both to initiate he even used the word initiate in mm -hmm. the context of discussing initiation he said both sons and daughters both women and men should i expect them to do it um they'll be you know all my disciples should become gurus he never said only the men should no place has he ever said only the men should so um the only arguments even philosophically i'm hearing from the other side is there's one purport that suniti's purport in the bhagavatam where he's talking about a historical context and even that, Shri Prabhupada said, he's wrote a, a nice thing in a purport where he says, in the old days, uh, because that was a system, women mm -hmm. would not go out to preach. But now I am proud to declare that both my women and men disciples are going and preaching and I'm, I'm glad to do, that they're doing it. And I'm, I'm encouraging them based on Bhagavad Gita. So one, he says it's scripturally based. Two, he says as a prerogative as an acharya, I'm doing it. And three, he's confirming that historically it wasn't done. And he's, he's, he's explaining that that was a history. So he's giving a complete clarification that his decision is bona fide based on scripture to promote equally in leadership of Krishna consciousness, both men and women, um, while recognizing historically it wasn't done. Mm -hmm. That's right. So he, he's answered all those questions. He's given in letters, in writing, in purports. Um, you know, so the, the arguments on the philosophical side also are quite slim and very tenuously connected, in my opinion. I agree. And I, I believe Chandrasekhar Maharaj is going to go into this in more depth. Um, just from my point of view as a lifetime preacher in North America, I have never seen more explicit instructions from Srila Prabhupada being overridden by anyone in any leadership role in our movement ever. Is shocking. It should put it to bed when, when, the, when he was asked about it, he's very specific. He never said no. <laughs> he only said yes. Um, but the, the um, you know, Prabhu, if I might just, just say candidly, the, the degree of absorption and antipathy towards women initiating that comes from some of my god brothers or friends, it's, it's shocking. It's amazing. It reminds me of the Buddha story, you know, the two monks, one of them helps a woman across the river. Right. A few miles later, the other one asks, you helped a woman. <laughs> I helped her for one minute and you've been carrying her for 10 hours. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Why are they so absorbed in this? I mean, it's just, to me, it's just a huge distraction from my service to Prabhupada. I want to just preach and bring people to Krishna consciousness, but I have to make all this extra, extraneous endeavor to just stand up for the women. It's, the other thing is about the, the argument we hear sometimes, well, we need to establish Varnashram. Well, first of all, Varnashram, as we know clearly from the scripture, has a secondary place to bhakti. And it was rejected by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu when Ramananda Roy put it up as a, as a step forward, as a path forward. Now, we can look at Srila Prabhupada's last uh, months and his manifest pastimes. He, he, he said, I've established 50% of my mission with book distribution. Now I want to establish the other 50% Varnashram. He was coming to Gita Nagari for that purpose. And my, uh, my um, companions and I were heading to Gita Nagari to meet him there. I mean, it was, you know, this was our uh, big chance to see him one more time. And... Uh, uh, 
Abhi Ram Prabhu, who was Prabhupada's nurse and with him in his party at that time, said his concern was he saw the brahmacharis were not fit to remain renunciates for life. That was his concern. He wanted to make sure that they did not leave Krishna consciousness because they were getting married. He wanted to show them how to live as householders and spend their lives in Krishna consciousness, even if they were not cut out to be lifelong ministers of religion. Right. right. So, so that was the emotional motivator for Prabhupada. So now when these devotees say, well, we have to, we can't have Veda, um, Vaishnavi gurus because it's not part of Varna Ashram. It just uh, shocks me to think that they are putting the Varna Ashram more important or on a higher platform than preaching, given Srila Prabhupada's example and very clear instructions on this matter. Um, and, and again, it was not Varna Ashram or Vedic for women to go out and do books. Prabhupada applauded them, you know, and they raised millions of dollars, much of which was funneled to India for the uh, international projects there. Uh, so my, my point is that women are. Uh, <clears throat> the goddesses of fortune for our preaching in North America. When the women are treated equitably, when we made that modest change in Gainesville, everything happened. And it's happening now in other centers as well. Yes, thank you, Prabhu. Uh, this is a very, uh, very enlightening discussion with you, Prabhu. Uh, and I hope our viewers and listeners of this recording will uh, also enjoy it and find it, uh, or can reflect on it and find it uh, uplifting, encouraging, and also perhaps eye-opening. Uh, so in closing, Prabhu, do you have any uh, remarks summarize? Yes, Prabhu. Thank you very much for, again, uh, helping uh, help us promote this or get this information out. The, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the recent moratorium that the GBC placed under pressure from leaders in India uh, was very discouraging for all of us who preach in North America. Uh, we've been through all this discussion and debate and the GBC came up to this conclusion, let each part of the world decide a very wise and equitable decision with, with which we were very happy. And so this has been a great discouragement to us who are preaching and, and we've really struggled with it. So to demonstrate how unpopular and unwise this decision is, we have organized a, a, a petition. In just a short time, we have over 2000 people who have signed it from more than 50 countries around the world. Uh, about a third of them roughly of Indian descent, saying, no, this is wrong. We think women who are qualified should have leadership roles and initiate disciples. So it, it is vastly unpopular. It is vastly discouraging to, to those of us who are struggling to reach a more difficult audience you know, in, in non-Hindu societies. It, it amazes me how my brothers in India can't see this, you know, that uh, their, their audience is almost all Hindu. And, and, and that's all they have experience with. And it is so much uh, helpful to have support and cooperation for reaching people, bringing them to Krishna consciousness in other parts of the world. I hope those who are watching this will hear me and hear us with our unanimous views that yes, we need women in leadership roles. Please don't squelch our preaching. Please work with us cooperatively. That was how Prabhupada said we could most ardently show our love for him after his departure. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Kalakanta Prabhu. So, uh, and thank you, dear devotees who are watching this on, uh, on the channels. And we look forward to uh, discussing more on this topic with other leaders of ISKCON. So please stay tuned on this YouTube channel. Hare Krishna. Thank you.